Okay, hello everyone and welcome to The Culture Report. I'm Jamal Simon. I'm DeMarco Randall. And I'm Antonia Velas. And guess what? It's Pride Month! Happy Pride! Happy Pride! Pride. We have a lot of things in the works. It's really, really fun. I yeah. can't wait for you guys to see what we're working up, what we're cooking up. Absolutely. Oh. And we're starting off with a bang. So queer pop icon Chapel Roan keeps making headlines, this time for something other than topping charts. During her performance at the Governor's Ball Music Festival in New York, she told the audience that the White House had invited her to perform at a Pride celebration, but she declined, calling for, quote, liberty and justice for all. Roan also recited lines from the Emma Lazarus poem engraved at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty, which she was dressed up as, to make an even bigger statement. You have forgotten what's etched on my pretty little toes. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That means freedom and trans rights. It especially needs freedom for all oppressed people in occupied territories. Absolutely. And a new report is highlighting the challenges LGBTQ plus people face when it comes to cancer prevention and treatment. In what it calls a first of its kind study, the American Cancer Society found LGBTQ plus individuals are likely at a higher risk for cancer. The study says it stems from the fear of being turned away from care and discrimination within the healthcare community. Researchers say 30% of medical students surveyed say they were not comfortable treating transgender patients. The ACS says that this study is just the first step. The organization hopes to continue its research to further understand the cancer risk within the LGBTQ community. And calls for the resignation of Colorado Republican Chairman Dave Williams are growing. And though Williams has been called out in the past for using party resources to bolster his chances for a seat in Congress, it was his recent anti-LGBTQ rhetoric that made criticisms ramp up. Now, last week, Williams sent a mass email to other Republicans calling for the burning of all pride flags and saying members of the LGBTQ plus community were, quote, godless groomers. The email also told parents to pull their children from public schools, saying Democrats use schools to turn more kids trans. Valdemar Archuleta, the leader of an LGBTQ conservatives group, told Nine News anchor Kyle Clark the messages don't reflect the majority of the party. It has really bad optics. It looks bad. And my primary concern or the thing I'm most upset about is that this does not represent the party well. Does it um, just look bad or is it bad? It is bad. <laughs> it is bad. Now, some other Republicans are echoing Archuleta's statement and say they've collected enough signatures to force a vote to remove him as chairman of the party. In response, Williams accused those who signed of being, quote, so-called Republicans and sent a second email this week restating that Quote, God hates pride. Now, this obviously has been making headlines in Colorado, but in other places as well. Um, and I think it's important to kind of discuss, first and foremost, that, you know, not all conservatives and not all Republicans are homophobic um, or intolerant in, in any, you know, which way that you want to put it. Um, but with that being said, though, the impact of a leader of a party kind of coming out and saying this very direct uh, message to a community and kind of doubling down on that statement, I mean, it's it can be pretty harmful. And to echo just what, like you were just saying, Antonia, not every Republican in there has those same ideas and beliefs. Mm -hmm. Like the, I believe she's the head of the Jefferson Republican Party or committee or whatever their name is, I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but she sent a formal letter to Dave asking him to resign. So I mean, like, it shows in that instance that, hey, we don't support that, and you need to, like, remove yourself from it if you're not going to get behind it and, like, wake up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's said that he says some of these things or does certain things, so to promote his, you know, chances for Congress or whatever he wants to do. And I just feel like it's odd. One, I'm glad that Arch Archuleta spoke out yeah. to say like, hey, not all of us think this way. Yes. And also that there are queer conservatives. Yes. And I think that it's wild that some people, whether they run for office or whatever, will alienate 
a whole group of people. And I'm like, you do realize some of your constituents are also queer people. So I'm like, that's a portion of the vote that you will never get. Right. It's like uh, like negating the fact that there are queer voters and a lot of them at that. And like more and more, I, I know that I know a lot of queer conservatives or mm-hmm. like people who have yeah. conservative like beliefs and ideals um, who just happen to be queer. Um, so I think on that in that side of it, it's also just a little bit bizarre that someone who is also trying to like bolster his position Mm -hmm. is like putting out this rhetoric. But in addition to that, I'm just also like, just thinking about the overall impact to the queer community and to right. young people who are, you know, maybe trying to develop their own, you know, what are my political beliefs? What am I going to stand for? Are getting educated and like learning about the world and making their minds up, seeing someone with, you know, such a an important or like prominent leadership position in a state saying these things, mm-hmm. like that can have a really horrible impact on you know, how they later identify. Because if they're like, oh, okay, then I I think that I align with a lot of Republican beliefs. Does that mean then that I also have to be intolerant? Does that mean then that I also have to be homophobic? But a lot of this is based in religion, and a lot of what he said was even based in religion. And I'm like, what happened so I know that a lot, America in general was founded with Christianity in mind. Right. I know it's kind of ingrained in our constitution and all the things. I'm like, what happened to separating church and state? I know a lot of conservatives that aren't even religious. I know yes. quite a few. Actually, I feel like most of the conservatives I know are atheists. So, And I feel like it's kind of just like a grab at attention, you know, like instead of getting the votes from the policies that you're implementing, like you're just going to go and generalize some type of topic and try to get votes that way rather than going and doing the actual work of, you know, having policies into place and going and meeting with these other people on the other side. Right. And potentially hurting people along the way. So yeah. all around pretty gloomy stuff. Wow. All right. Um, The United Nations Security Council passed a ceasefire proposal to stop the bloodshed in Gaza. The proposal, which was drafted by the U.S. and approved by President Biden, was finalized Sunday. Hamas said, in part, that it, quote, welcomes what was included in and confirmed by the Security Council resolution regarding a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. A spokesperson for the U.S. mission to the U.N. said Israel accepted this proposal, but a senior Biden administration official told NBC News the recent rescue of four Israelis who were being held hostage by Hamas strengthened Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's determination to continue the Gaza invasion. Now, on Wednesday, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Hamas had requested numerous changes to the plan for releasing hostages and putting an end to the fighting in Gaza, some of which, he says, are not possible. And last week, President Joe Biden signed an executive order that will limit the number of asylum seekers who cross the southern border. This is his most restrictive border policy since taking office. This action will help us gain control of our border, restore order into the process. Now, the order temporarily suspends requests for asylum once the average number of border crossings exceeds 2,500, meaning it went into effect immediately as that average had already been surpassed. The border would reopen if the number of crossings goes down to 1,500. The Biden administration has since said the new restrictions have not caused the number of border crossings to drop yet, but they expect them to slow down at some point. Right now, the average is about 4,000 people per day. Now, for the first time in Mexico's history, a woman will be head of state. Two weeks ago, the people of Mexico elected 61-year-old Claudia Scheinbaum as president. Scheinbaum, a climate scientist and the former mayor of Mexico City, said she would keep leading the country in the direction that outgoing leftist president Andrés Manuel López Obrador had. The change of command takes place October 1st. A British Mexican man was given a six month suspended sentence and will be deported from Qatar after he was arrested on drug charges in what his family calls an unjust honey trap operation on Grindr, a gay dating app. The BBC reports 44 year old Manuel Guerrero Aviña had arranged to meet a man named Gio, but behind the screen were the Qatari police, according to his family members. Aviña's relatives insist police planted drugs in his apartment, and he believes he was targeted because of his sexual orientation. Being gay is illegal in Qatar. 
Amnesty International says Qatar officials' tests for illegal substances in his system were, quote, questionable, and Avinia maintains he did not take any drugs. The BBC reports he was forced to thumbprint a confession written in Arabic without a translator or access to a lawyer, and that during the 42 days Avinia was detained, he was not given regular access to his HIV medication. Avinia has said he's considered appealing his sentence. And this month, the Supreme Court is set to rule on two major abortion cases with significant nationwide implications. It'll be the first time they picked up the issue since their decision to overturn Roe v. Wade back in 2022. The court is weighing whether to place more restrictions on the abortion pill mifepristone, including putting new roadblocks on, the ac on access by mail. In the other case, which is lesser known, the justices are considering whether a near-total abortion ban in Idaho conflicts with the conflicts with the federal law requiring emergency medical care for patients, including pregnant women. And a trad wife TikToker is now out of a job and has social media divided and confused after she casually used the N-word in one of her videos. So in case I haven't mentioned, she is white. You can take a look at the now viral video. Everybody I know who's married right now, they're married to broke Um... Girl, oh she said what you thought she said. So after she posted this, people naturally called her out, but she doubled down, citing the First Amendment. And she has since been fired from her job. The company made a post saying that it's owned and operated by a black immigrant woman who took immediate action when hearing the news. So Christ first, Almighty! <laughs> first, 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 first and foremost, first and foremost, oh. first and first. So she said the word. Okay, I said that people were confused in the comments because she didn't use it offensively per se if someone non-black can say the n-word non-offensively she didn't use it in a derogatory manner she used it in the context that black people use it in my experience so i'm just curious to you guys i have my own opinion do you guys think that slurs i suppose are okay as long as it's used in a different context like a no. conversational context no point blank period no especially as a white woman that word carry or as a white person that word carries such a negative and loaded historical context where her ancestors were probably using it against black people mm. years and years back it's just something that has to do with you know, just because she didn't say it directly at someone as mm -hmm. an insult, it yeah. doesn't mean that it can't have that same effect on someone. Someone could be triggered potentially from hearing that coming out of a white person's mouth. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, do I want to use it? Not really. No, I have no interest in that. That didn't really upset me as much as what she said a few days after that went viral was she started to thank the black community for helping her launch her new career in conservative media. She said, you all played your roles like the puppets you are. Now that's where she got me a little that's heated. That's so crazy. That's where she got me a little heated. Like you can say the N word all you want. That's your life. You do what you want. You also have to deal with the consequences like losing your job. I like, also, oops. I also feel like the thing we have to keep in mind is when folks are using this type of language, they're clearly very comfortable. This is something that they probably grew up with and were talking to like at home, like, and it's not okay. Yeah, you, 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 need to, you need to be able to like realize your place and the actions that your words have. Well, I mean, she knows, she, she seems like a, honestly, a very educated woman. She seems- Well, clearly not. Well, I mean, I mean, book smart, big smart. Cause you know, she says this is her first amendment and she posted a quote, saying that like the First Amendment was created to protect offensive speech, which I agree because, I mean, it's protected to protect you from the people who may be offended by your words. Because if no one said anything offensive, there would be no reason for you to protect the words. You know what I mean? Which I get, but I feel like we're taking that all out of context. Oh, absolutely. And I think as society changes and l the world changes and people change, like we can also adapt that to fit what is right and what is the norm. And we're discussing this 
the question I'm sure people are wondering is, is it worth it? Like, is it worth having these discussions when, of course, we're just putting money in our pocket? Like, sure, she just got fired, but she's also on all these different news outlets and all these conservative news outlets. Let me right. say that. Um, so is this worth having a conversation about it all or should we just ignore it? Definitely needs to have a conversation because you need to have have the accountability and the ability to tell people that, hey, you cannot be talking like that. Even if it's not in an offensive, derogatory way, even using that language is harmful. Yeah. It hurts that community. It hurts people who, like, people like her are just, like, insensitive to it, and they're always going to, like, choose to say what they want and back it up by the First Amendment. But in reality, they're just backing up their own ignorance. We're listening. Well, shout out to you, Lily girl. You do your thing, I guess. Uh, please don't. Be, please actually, stop. yes. No, actually, like, please actually. don't. Please don't. But Colorado has a new state law designed to, um, designed to study the systemic racism and how it impacts black Coloradans. So this is good. This is good, guys. Representative Nikita Ricks is a sponsor on the law, and she says that she hopes to spotlight the historical and ongoing effects of systemic racism to shape future policies. We thought that it was very important to not look at only the historical context of Blacks in Colorado, but also to look at the economic impact of and the financial impact, what this has caused the Black community and what it could look if we were on par with other members of the community. Right. The study is being supported by private funding, not with state dollars. The nonprofit collaborative healing initiative within communities or CHIC has been gathering donations since late last year. The study needs seven hundred eighty five thousand dollars by the end of June 2025. One teacher in Colorado is making changes in the present by helping preserve the past. For decades, Japanese Americans have been fighting to preserve the incarceration camp their families were unjustly imprisoned in during World War II. Recently, Amachi, located in southeastern Colorado, became an official part of the national park system. Some thanks for that goes to Grenada high school teacher John Hopper. 30 years ago, he started teaching students about this dark part of history. And since then, he and generations of students have restored landmarks, renovated the cemetery, and even established a museum. Many of them attended the ceremony when it became a part of the state park system and had a chance to meet survivors and descendants. It became important uh, to educate everybody as you could because, you know, as history, you've got to learn the, the good with the bad, just being the bad of U.S. history, so that we don't repeat it again. Absolutely. And even though they've handed it over to the state, students will still get to be involved at Amachi. Nine News reporter Courtney Yoon spoke with some students and a few survivors of Amachi who credit them for helping to preserve their stories. You can watch the full story now on Nine News Plus. And earlier this month at Big Bear Ice Arena in Denver, USA Sled Hockey and the Colorado Sled Hockey Association hosted a sled hockey camp. Now that's a lot of sleds, right? I caught up with Jerry Duvall, president of the Colorado Sled Hockey Association, Malik Jones, a Paralympic gold medalist, and Robin Hill with the USA Women's National Sled Hockey Team to talk about why the camps like this are so important. Uh oh, there he goes! You guys need to communicate, and he needs to say, or you need to say, you got him, and he has backside. This is where I need to be, and um, helping out these kids and trying to grow the sport. It's good to see those kids, you know, just having fun out here and, you know, having a love for a sport. Even though they are disabled, they're able to find something that they that they like to do. Oh, this is like the only disabled sport that is almost identical to the actual sport of hockey, right? Like wheelchair basketball, it's it's totally different because of the different angles, and then you don't dribble all the time. Yeah. You could, like, and then the wheelchair lacrosse is different because of the way you move, um, and they're all different. Where the sled hockey is almost 100% exactly the same, except we move with our arms, control the puck with our arms, we do everything with our arms. When I was a kid, this wasn't an opportunity where I had female mentors. Now these kids can see, yeah, I want to be just like you because a women can play the sport. I'm here just like the men are. We have, I think, one youth girl and then six other adult female players. And to see that many girls out there on the ice has been incredible to see. Um, and to be able to be a mentor to them. Hi, it was so great to see all the girls here. And to educate these athletes that came to the camp 
to know, all right, there's one way to do something, but there's also a different way to do something. As female male athletes, that is a little different. It's important to have this sort of camp because you allow kids to understand the growth that they need to develop. It's all part of that promise when, I, when my life was spared. I'll go all the way to Grand Junction, Durango, Pueblo, uh, Fort Collins, Greeley, anywhere there's an ice rink, I'll go and I'll host a sled hockey clinic to just try to spread awareness of what the sport is and where you could participate and how you could participate, right? This whole time I didn't realize people were actually watching what I'm doing. Well, one way to inspire people is to do events like this, right? Where you bring people from all over the country and you show them just like what these gold medal guys are doing, guys and gals are doing. We did a study up in Boulder and our guy Malik Jones, he hit 18 and a half miles an hour from the goal line to, to half ice and that's moving, you know? I mean, some of these NHL guys are or mid 20s, you know, and he's just right there below him, not, and he's all using upper body. Guys can look at me and see, okay, he's of color, he's disabled, but he's still, you know, living his life, doing, achieving his dreams. So, like, it doesn't matter what you look like, what your disabled disability is, you know, you can achieve anything. You just set your mind to it, hard work, consistency, and uh, anything can really happen if you put your mind to it. Everybody dreams, and to plant that seed in their mind, like. You can do it. Don't let anything stop you. You gotta be loud though. Eyes on three. One, two, three. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. That is so awesome. And like he said, he really wanted to spread awareness. He just made me aware. I didn't even know this existed. Yeah. So I yeah. think it's really awesome that we're seeing more sports become more accessible totally. to more people. And just to that point that you just made, what Jerry was talking to me about with being nominated for the Willie o, really, really o Ray Community Hero Award is that the greatest thing that he had from this is the exposure to the sport. Yeah. Getting the sport out there and getting the word out for these kids to have the same opportunity that able-bodied people have is huge. That's awesome. And we love seeing more women and people of color, too. That's awesome. On That's the so ice? great. Yeah. I haven't been out there yet. <laughs> we'll see, though. Well, maybe we'll get you out there soon. Okay. And let's hop into the I wasn't the slopes. <laughs> let's hop into our good news. <laughs> All right, and for the first time, the NHL is offering a broadcast of the Stanley Cup Finals in American Sign Language. It features play-by-play -play in color and sign language and a graphic visual visualizing real-time crowd noise. The alternative telecast is available streaming on ESPN+. And Denver is making moves toward providing necessary resources to people experiencing homelessness. The city council recently passed a resolution that would create a $1 million contract between the city of Denver and the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, which, pending the mayor's signature, would give folks access to telehealth and allow for more behavior health staff at permanent housing sites. Media personality and now philanthropist T.S. Madison is launching the T.S. Madison Starter House in Atlanta. Madison hopes that this transitional home will become a safe haven for black trans women with troubling pasts yet limit limitless futures. She adds, that, she adds that at its core, the initiative is built on the principle that when black trans women are healthy, funded, supported, and safe, the entire black queer community will prosper. Period. So thank you, T.S., we for love that. that. That's super awesome, especially in the South, because I know that they're killed. They are infected with HIV at a way crazier rate right. than anywhere else. So I really think that's an awesome, awesome thing. But so y'all know the house is not open yet. She said that a bunch of she's had a bunch of people fly out there as soon as they heard the news trying to get a place to stay. It's not open yet. Still under construction, still doing some things, still getting beds together. So But it's still good news. Still really, really good, good news. news. All right, thank you guys so much for joining this week's culture report. We'll be back to continue the conversation right here on 9 News Plus and 9news.com.